Our reading this evening is from James chapter 1, which you'll find in the Pew Bibles on page 1213. So I'll just give you a minute to look that up. So it's James chapter 1 on page 1213. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. He gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away, even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from God above, coming down from the, fa- from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits for all he created. My dear brothers, Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious, and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted in this world. Amen. Good evening. Um, In our prayers of intercession tonight, we're going to start thinking about local issues and then just work our way out to the wider world and issues happening in the wider world. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who covets our prayers and delights to answer them. Thank you that even now, your son is sitting at your right hand and he is interceding for us as we intercede for others. Locally, we pray in connection with the recent court hearing in London concerning Sinead and ask that you would grant her your peace and patience as she awaits a decision. We also pray the same for any others in our congregation awaiting news in whatever form. 
We give thanks for the Men in Bloomfield event held yesterday morning and the excellent research carried out by George Busby into the secret radio listeners uh, province-wide who fed information to, through to uh, people in buildings at Gilnahirk and made a vital contribution to the ending of the Second World War. Help us not to take our safety and security for granted. And in that regard, we pray for our government at this time of uncertainty. We pray that you will give it the wisdom that it requires. In the coming week, we pray for the church committee as it meets on Tuesday night. And we also pray for those organising the logistical arrangements in connection with keeping organisations functioning during the current building programme. We pray for those organising the Thanksgiving events next weekend. And we particularly pray for the builder, Leo Matheson, as he comes to talk to us on the Friday evening. We continue to pray for the progress of the project and safety on site. We lift our home groups and other groups as they meet during the week to continue with community Bible experience. We also pray for walkway as it continues working with local children at the homework club and on a Sunday. We also lift our uniformed and youth groups to you and pray that even now you would be drawing young hearts to a saving faith in you. Today, PCI asks us to pray for our moderator, Dr. Charles McMullen, as he takes services in Ballina and Sligo, and also on Wednesday as he launches the new visitor exhibition in assembly buildings. We're also asked to pray for the Council for Social Witness, as it oversees the work of residential homes, a nursing home, homes for those with a disability, both mental and physical, a substance misuse centre, an ex-offender centre, and a church for the deaf ministry. Heavenly Father, in the midst of this diverse range of services, please give conveners, key staff, and care staff your compassion as they deal with the needs of each individual in these establishments. We give thanks for the latest prayer news bulletin from Helen Little, and thank you that she was able to enjoy the beauty of a traditional Japanese garden in the midst of downtown Tokyo as she visited around nine families. We pray that Helen will have an enjoyable return visit to Nane and that you will give her uh, those that it will be good for her to meet with. We also pray for her visit to Northern Honshu to visit five OMF families scattered around the region and pray for the Wong family as they settle back after a year-long home assignment in Australia. And we pray particularly for Emily as she settles back into the local primary school. We pray for Pastor and Mrs Horita as today is their last Sunday at the Lighthouse Church after serving there for eight years. And pray for Pastor Yu and his wife as they arrive at the start of April. We pray that all will be sensitive to God's Holy Spirit and will have an awareness of the new and good things that God has for them. Thank you that Helen's flight home is booked for a seven-month home assignment commencing in June. We pray for wisdom for her in sorting out her apartment and car, which she hopes to keep during this period. We particularly pray for daily energy and stamina needed by Helen to get through what she has to do. Help Helen to rest in you. Finally, we turn to the country of Nigeria, where the news is getting progressively worse. We pray for families of more than 300 people killed during the months of February and March in seven predominantly Christian regions by Fulani extremists. We pray for local church leaders 
and also for President Buhari, a Fulani Muslim, and ask that appropriate action be taken against these Fulani herdsmen to safeguard the lives of your people. We thank you for what we heard recently from Kathleen and Daniel in Life Builders about Nigeria and pray that they would walk closely with you as they minister into this increasingly hostile situation. These prayers we ask in the name and for the sake of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. Um, a wee handout is being distributed uh, just as we speak, and uh, while that's happening, uh, I'll mention the book for this evening called Befriend by Scott Souls. Uh, Scott was on the staff of Redeemer Church in New York, worked alongside Tim Keller, and uh, the back of the book says, we live in a world where real friendship is hard to find Suspicious of others and insecure about ourselves, we retreat into the safety of our small, self-made digital worlds. And uh, uh, Scott Souls is contending that those who have a message to share are mandated to befriend the other, befriend prodigals and Pharisees, befriend the shamed and ashamed, befriend sexual minorities, befriend dysfunctional family members, befriend children, befriend those grieving and dying, befriend the poor and empty-handed. A really stimulating read. Who would enjoy this book? First to raise your hand will have it for this coming week's reading. Who would like it? Okay, there we go. Dr. Amy. You will have that to enjoy. Well, now, if it's handy to have page one zero uh, one two one three open, uh, as you can see, we'll be looking at the book of James this evening. I, I wonder, have you ever wondered what it would like to, if you'd actually met Jesus? Uh, I mean, looked him in the eye and said hello. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that he was privileged enough to meet Jesus on the road to Damascus as one untimely born. The Apostle Peter, whose first letter we'll be thinking about next Sunday night, actually spent three years of his life with Jesus, walking with him, talking with him, being discipled, rebuked, and encouraged by him. And James, well, James actually grew up with him. I remember a lad at school who did an exchange visit with a Spaniard, and he told me how disconcerting it was uh, because his Spanish friend was called Jesus. And he just couldn't bring himself to say, pass the salt, Jesus. He just couldn't do it. And yet, that's what Jesus uh, will have experienced from James. Uh, James will have played with him. He will have wrestled with him, eaten with him, worked alongside him. uh, Because James, the author of this book, is none other than the brother of Jesus, or should we say half-brother of Jesus. So what he writes here is authentic, real, gritty, eyewitness stuff, and something I think we need to listen to with eager expectation. Now, being the brother of Jesus doesn't, of course, give uh, what he writes any more authority than other Bible books, but it is interesting to me that neither does he claim any extra kudos from that relationship. In fact, if anything, it's the opposite. Instead instead of calling Jesus my brother, as we might expect him to do, uh, can you see how James actually begins the epistle in chapter 1, verse 1? 
James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's no familiarity breeding contempt here, only profound respect. James was often nicknamed James the Just or James the Righteous because he was known for his profound piety and spirituality. And it was said that he had knees that resembled those of a camel. So much did he spend time praying. James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and since we know he died a martyr's death in the year AD 62, and he also presided at the Council of Jerusalem mentioned in Acts chapter 15, where the early followers of Jesus had to work out how Gentile converts fitted within the Jewish Christian community. It is reckoned that this letter must have been written really early. Maybe it's the earliest book in the New Testament with the possible exception of Galatians. So now you might like to look at the handout and uh, from the top left, you will see that the name Jesus is, uh, or sorry, the name James is very familiar in the New Testament. It's the same as the Hebrew name Jacob. So Jacob is a great name and so is James. Um, And chapter 1, verse 1, tells us that James's letter is written to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. In other words, it was written originally for Jewish believers who had had to flee Jerusalem after the persecution of the followers of the Lord Jesus. It's not a letter like Paul's or Peter's, which were written to address particular situations or doctrines. It is more of a book of wisdom, full of metaphors, one-liners, that would remind you of the book of Proverbs or Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And James wants his readers to know that not only does Jesus speak wisdom, but he is wisdom. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament Torah, the law, which is summed up by Jesus' own words, love God and love your neighbor. The Christian faith, James contends, is an extremely practical faith. If the Christian faith isn't practical, it's not worth following. But if we listen to what God says and then do it, uh, do you see in verses 19 through to 27, then that faith is truly wise. And so says James in chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, she or he should ask God for wisdom, and God just loves to answer that prayer without equivocation. I wonder if by any chance uh, somebody has come here tonight puzzled about something, worrying or wondering what to do, which way to go. Well, says James, the brother of Jesus, ask God for wisdom who gives generously. And that is a really glorious promise. In your own time, you might like to read James chapter 1 again to see how, in fact, it introduces the reader to all the main themes, the key words from the rest of the book. This is like a little taster of the menu that's going to come later. And uh, we'll see how uh, the follower of the Lord Jesus may become perfect or complete. Those are two words that James loves. And, uh, for example, you can see the whole... uh, how that works out uh, in uh, chapters 2, 3 uh, to 5. And there, uh, in chapters 2 following, James gives us 12 teachings about what wholehearted devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ looks like. 
uh, and it's these that you're go we're going to look at now. Now, if you see uh, the handout here, if you start here and work your way down to there, this is one, this is two, three, four, five, and then it goes over to six to here, to seven, to eight, and up, all right? So, you follow me, the sort of uh, sequence there. Uh, what are the 12 teaching areas uh, that uh, James is going to point us to? The first teaching is about favoritism versus love. That's chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. The second is concerning genuine faith. The third, Karen has referred us to, it's the use of our tongues. The fourth is the difference between true and false wisdom. Number five is on a divided heart. Uh, number six is condemning others, and then look at the middle right-hand side of the page, and that addresses the arrogance of wealth, then the danger of wealth, then patience and endurance, telling the truth is number 10, faith-filled prayer is number 11, and last of all, restoring others uh, brings us to the last couple of verses of chapter 5. I've actually highlighted those numbered 1 to 12 in my own Bible uh, because of that. Now, in each of these 12 teachings, James spells out a real-life scenario, uh, a situation every Christian believer can easily imagine in their mind's eye. And then he gives specific Bible teaching, both from the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, in uh, chapter 2, he quotes, for example, from Leviticus, Exodus, and Deuteronomy. And then he makes a couple of pithy memorable one-liners such as in verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. And then every one of the 12 teachings highlighted here can be linked directly to things that Jesus himself said. Uh, so, for example, you will note that uh, below every scenario here in the handout, there's a Bible reference, particularly from Matthew's gospel, such as Matthew 5. Uh, verses 46 to 48, where Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Does the tax collector not do just exactly that? If you greet only your brother, that is people just like you, then how does that make you any different from anybody else? Do not even pagans do that? And then uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount adds, be perfect there as your heavenly Father is perfect. And remember, that's one of the words that James picks up in chapter 1 as a regular theme, perfection. Uh, you'll see it in chapter 1, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 17, and chapter 1, verse 25. So, if you show favoritism uh, in James chapter 2, verse 9, you sin. You are a lawbreaker. Instead, writes James, Christian behavior demands Christ likeness towards people not like us. And that's what ought to distinguish believers in Jesus from any other Tom, Dick, or Harry who don't follow the perfect man, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Just this week, I read a survey that found that only 18% of millennials find Christianity relevant to their lives. Well, if Christians live indistinguishably from everybody else in society, that's hardly surprising, is it? The book of James shows us that when those who own the name Christian are in fact different in attitude and action, instead of being cool, their lifestyle is nonetheless supremely attractive and relevant. It's generally reckoned that James, who wrote this letter, was beaten to death by clubs for living out a Christ-like radically different way of life. And this is the same group of believers in the early church who, as a result of their faith, treated poor people respectfully in exactly the same way as the rich, 
treated slaves just as caringly as landowners, who rescued unwanted children left out to die and gave generously to people experiencing famine while they themselves had very little in their own pockets. So if the Christian church today lived out even one of the 12 teachings highlighted here by James uh, with wholehearted devotion to Jesus, perhaps a lot more than 18% of this modern generation would acknowledge the relevance of Christianity. Do you remember how James began his letter? James, a bondservant of God, a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he says, following the teaching of Jesus, not just in word, but in deed, verse 12, it's not bondage. It's not some sort of draconian form of slavery, not at all. Christ's law is, in fact, the way of freedom. And that's something we were looking at this morning in John's teaching. Uh, John chapter 8, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So here's James, the bondservant of God, experiencing freedom in Jesus Christ. Now, tempting though it might be, we are not going to try to work our way through the 12 teachings highlighted here backed up by Jesus' own words concerning wholehearted devotion to Jesus. That is a whole terms sermon series, and actually it's put me in the notion of one. But let's just focus on one. So why not then look at the second one found in the box called Genuine Faith, and that focuses on chapter 12, verses 14 through to 26, And that, in turn, refers to Jesus' own words in Matthew 7, 21 to 27. Now, do you remember I said that in chapter 1, we have the highlights of the topics that are going to be discussed in the rest of the book? So, for example, the very last verse of chapter 1 says, do you want to know what real life, pure and faultless religion looks like? And then he gives us Maybe a very surprising answer. What does real life, pure and faultless religion look like? It's looking after orphans and widows in their distress. Now I consider this scenario in chapter 2, 14 through to 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if a person claims to have faith but has no deeds. Is that what you might term saving faith? This past Thursday, many of you know, I was in London appearing as a witness at the appeal for a member of this congregation who fits the very description of chapter 1, verse 27. I can tell you it was a fairly brutal experience. Just in case anybody thinks that this country is sympathetic to Christians fleeing persecution for their faith, let me read to you from an article that coincidentally appeared the very next day in the London Times. And some of you will be aware of this. It is entitled, Home Office Cites Bible to Deny Asylum. The Home Office refused asylum to an Iranian who converted from Islam to Christianity because an official in the Home Office said Christianity was not a peaceful religion. Immigration officials wrote to the man turning down his asylum request the man who had converted to Christianity on the ground that it was a peaceful religion, citing violent passages from the Bible to support their claim. They said that many parts of the Bible, including the book of Revelation, was filled with imagery of revenge, destruction, uh, death and violence. 
an immigration caseworker who was helping the unnamed asylum seeker shared the letter and said that he was shocked by this unbelievably offensive diatribe being used to justify a refusal of asylum. And then the Church of England condemned the lack of religious literacy of the official after the asylum seeker said he now per faced persecution in Iran for his faith. And they called for a serious overhaul of Home Office policies. Now, why I quote that is because while supporting our Bloomfield member going through the trauma of Home Office cross-examination with evidently no comprehension that imprisonment for faith or persecution looks what it looks like. I suddenly felt enormously privileged to be able to stand behind, beside her in her time of need. The result will not be known for a few weeks late, uh, yet. And thank you, Jeff, for praying for her tonight. And I encourage you still to do that. Whatever the outcome, I nonetheless felt glad that somehow we as a congregation were in some measure able to do something practical to help her. And I felt truly blessed that we were able to do something more than simply acknowledge the fine work of Barnabas Fund or Open Doors working among our persecuted sisters and brothers overseas. To say more than is written in verse 16, go, I wish you well, keep warm and be fed we're actually able to do something to meet the physical need. It's not enough these days or any day to say, verse 19, I believe in God, as if somehow that makes you an especially virtuous human being. Even the demons believe that, says James, with devastating effect, and they shudder. No, faith without deeds, verse 20, is useless. Now note, please, there is not some great conflict between what Paul argues in Romans chapter 4 and what James writes here. When the Apostle Paul talks about works not justifying the individual, he is referring to religious rituals such as circumcision. These rituals, he says, are not magic. They can't bring us into our right relationship with God. Only faith can do that. James, however, isn't speaking about rituals, but about the way we behave in response to God. The only way we can demonstrate that we truly believe in God, the only way that we can show we have been truly justified by God is to act in obedience to his commands. Thus, Paul is talking about the impossibility of works leading to salvation, and James is talking about the necessity of works flowing from salvation. And so, James chapter 2, verse 25, arising out of her faith in God, Rahab, the prostitute of Jericho, didn't just bless the Hebrew spies with banal platitudes when they were seeking refuge. She actually gave them somewhere to stay. Can't you see, says James? And here we have one of those great and memorable wise proverbs, faith without deeds is dead. Well, we could go on all evening. Did you get the picture? This letter of James is a treasure chest of practical, down-to-earth, godly wisdom for Christians seeking to live faithful, pure, 
and godly lives. It's not moralism. It's not saying try hard and live like this. James knows that without the Holy Spirit's enabling, we're no more able to do that or indeed to want to do that in our own strength than uh, fly to Mars. Instead, this is a letter to God's people everywhere to keep going whatever the current challenges or trials or difficulties that you as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ might be experiencing. So let's finish then by quoting chapter 5, verse 10. James 5, verse 10. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as examples of patience in the face of suffering. Those we considered blessed, verse 11, are those who have been persecuted. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about for him. Yes? Well then, be encouraged. Because know this for your blessing. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So to his name be all glory and praise and honor both now and forever.